Welcome and thanks for joining us for Two Steps Forward, our daily Bible study. I'm James. This is Aid. We are now currently up to episode 330, uh, over halfway through Matthew's Gospel, Matthew chapter 17. Uh, I just met with somebody last week who has, um, she and her fiance have just started in Genesis. Uh, our some rough studies. stuff up there. Yeah, it's it's. A, I was actually listening to an episode of a podcast uh, yesterday where they were talking about they were concluding things and shifting into a new podcast. But uh, they were talking about the early days, and they specifically said, "Please don't go back and listen to the like if you so, listened." Meanwhile, I've been meaning to create a study guide for these, but I can't. I cannot bring myself. Well, you're I've 330 never... episodes behind. I've never listened to even one of them. Oh, really? Nope. Oh, wow. I can't bring myself to go back and listen to it. I can't. Between the nasally voice, I've the off-the-wall comments. I've thought about trying to do clip shows and stuff like that. There's just too much content, though, at this point. It's too much editing. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, no, it's good stuff, and we'll keep trucking. We're still probably 20%, a little over 20% through the Bible. <laughs> so. Oh. <laughs> Well, we'll get there someday, God willing. Uh, um, this will be like my life's work. That's right. When it's all said and done, this is the thing you can bury us with. Um, but I, what are you? We're happy what about it. Would you think about? Do you think that about going back and redoing some? Like, what if we did Genesis again? Well, back in the early days when we were trying to do five episodes a week. Yeah, that was We rough. were clipping through the Bible at a, this is beginning of the pandemic, at a pretty significant rate. And I thought, okay, if we do get through the Bible in a couple of years, we would have to go back and we can redo the episodes. Uh-huh. Then. We've slowed down a little bit for a variety of reasons. Um, but yeah, so the idea of getting back to Genesis. Yeah, I'd be interested to maybe re-record some of them. I don't yeah. know. Also, why I don't want to go watch them is because I was going through school and it was just so hard and there were so many painful moments. There was a cloud hanging over you at times. No, you were you were fine, but it was it was, it was at the beginning of a pandemic. Too. No, I mean, like, I don't want to relive all of the, oh, like, oh my gotcha. gosh, all the stress. And, and I don't want to hear my stories about all this... <laughs> <laughs> all the stuff I was so <laughs> the <laughs> minor injuries you've had over the years. All the stuff I was so stressed about that really ended yeah. up not being a big deal. Yeah. Well, all right. We are up to again Matthew 17. If you haven't read through it yourself yet, please do so. Uh, pause here and read Matthew 17 on your own. Uh, we start, however, with a summary, and it's the Transfiguration account. So a week after what we call Chapter 16. Jesus took his inner circle of disciples up a high mountain and transfigured before them. Uh, Everything about him became bright like light, and then Moses and Elijah appeared on his sides. Peter commented on how good it was to be there and offered to put up shelters for them to to stay the evening. Uh, But as Peter was speaking, a bright cloud swallowed and enveloped them, and the voice inside it said, This is my son whom I love. With him I am well pleased. Listen to him. And upon hearing this, the disciples fell to the ground in fear. Jesus came and touched them and said, don't be afraid. And when they looked up, only Jesus was there. Uh, They came down the mountain and Jesus told them not to tell anyone what they had seen until he was raised from the grave. And interestingly, each of these writers would write something about it, uh, kind of famously John and Peter, about the transfiguration event in their letters later on. Uh, The disciples asked why the teachers of the law said Elijah had to come first. And Jesus replied by saying that Elijah does have to come first, as prophesied, but he has come in the spirit of and person of John the Baptist, and they rejected him and will likewise reject Jesus also. Uh, At the bottom of the mountain, there was a crowd that had accumulated. A man knelt before Jesus, lamenting that his son had terrible seizures uh, as a result of a demon. He had nearly died multiple times. Uh, The demon had tried to throw him in the fire. Uh, The other disciples couldn't seem to heal him, and Jesus commented on how unbelieving this generation was. He had the boy brought to him, rebuked the demon, and immediately it came out. And the disciples naturally asked why they weren't able to drive out the demon since they had previously driven out other demons. Jesus explained that it was because of their lack of faith. And he says, nothing is impossible when you have faith, even a little faith. 
When they next got together in Galilee, Jesus explained how soon he was going to be betrayed, and he promised his death and resurrection, which again distressed his disciples. He, remember, mentions this to them numerous times to prepare them for it. And the final account in Matthew 17 uh, tells us that when they were in Capernaum, some tax collectors came and asked if Jesus paid the temple tax. This was an annual tax amongst the Israelites. It was two drachmas uh, per, per person. Peter replied that he uh, did, and then Peter came into the house where Jesus was at, and immediately asked, uh, Jesus asked Peter, who do the kings of the earth collect taxes from, their own sons or others? And Peter replied, well, kings collect taxes from other people, not from their own family. Jesus then replied that the children of God are exempt to the temple tax but so as not to cause public scandal, Jesus told Peter to go to the lake, throw out his line, and the first fish he'd catch, he'd be able to open its mouth and take out a four drachma coin, which would pay for both Peter's tax and Jesus' tax. Unique miracle only here in Matthew's gospel. That's mm. Matthew 17. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, devotional thoughts for the day. Number one. The Old Testament points to Christ. So the transfiguration event, which we've covered in other Gospels when we've studied before, but is a big enough deal, uh, kind of a turning point in Jesus' ministry that it's worth revisiting again. Uh, again, the Gospel writers certainly do. Um, it, it probably happens on a mount called Mount Hermon. We know they're up by Caesarea Philippi, and that was a mountain close to there. Um, it's a moment where Jesus displays his full divine glory, which he hasn't done this to this capacity. He's worked miracles, which are glimpses of his glory, but his full, like, unbridled holiness and glory, he has not fully revealed. Uh, he does it with his inner circle of disciples, and when he does this on the top of the mountain, uh, Moses appears on one side of him, Elijah appears on the other side. In the Jewish mind at that time, Moses was famous for being the great deliverer of those people, mm -hmm. just like... Abraham was father Abraham, but Moses was the deliverer of the people, and Elijah was the prophet. There's many prophets, but he was like the quintessential prophet amongst the Jewish people. Interestingly enough, the ones who came after Moses and Elijah are named Moses, the predecessor, the successor to Moses was a guy named Joshua, and the successor to Elijah's ministry was a guy named Elisha. And both of those names are very similar. Yahshua and Elishua both essentially mean the Lord God saves. And the other name basically in the language that was very familiar and similar was Yeshua, which is Jesus' name. And clearly all of it is like, uh, so everything in the Old Testament is coming to a head, coming to a peak on this mountain. And everything was designed to point ahead to Christ, the great deliverer and the final prophet and they are talking to him about his exodus from this world so that he can take his people into rise from the grave and take his people into the promised land and the point is like everything you go right down to the names of people that god chose to be the successors to certain ministry roles and stuff like that and god very clearly has a vision going back in history to who the messiah is going to be and Jesus is the final successor to Moses, the final successor to Elijah, the last and ultimate prophet and deliverer of Israel. Do you think Jesus knew from the beginning that he was going to have to do this? Or what do you, you mean? Think? What do you mean by the beginning? Like when he was a little kid? No. When he was God in heaven, three persons. He has to know, right? He was one person in the being of God. Yes. Okay. But do I think that he? Yes, I think he in heaven volunteered for the mission, uh, became human, and in his finite human state didn't fully necessarily understand everything at the beginning because uh -huh. in Luke 2 it says he grows in wisdom and stature and understanding and knowledge. Mm -hmm. So it's becoming clear to him, but even as a child, he stays at the temple because he says he must be in his father's house. So there was a, an awareness but increased clarity as time goes on. Mm -hmm. right? um, Part of the, so, I mean, one of the things that I want to see here is, is so it's Matthew's gospel. Matthew refers to the Old Testament more than any other. Matthew uh, has, has probably like the most thorough account of this transfiguration because it's, it, it really is an event that is the 
crescendoing of everything from the Old Testament is coming to a head here. Um, but I think my question for it here is, it's interesting, Peter on the top of the mountain offers to set up tents for mm-hmm. Moses, Elijah, and Jesus. And the question is like, well, why? Or what do we learn from that? Mm-hmm. He's clearly excited about what's happening. He's mm-hmm. clearly seen the glory of God. He's a doer. Like, I want this to happen. I, mm-hmm. I want to experience this further. Is there anything that we learn from that? You can't put Jesus in a tent. <laughs> Okay, is that nobody puts baby in the corner? What? Okay, I don't think that's the lesson. But what is? What are you? What? Is, what does any of that mean to you? It means that it's like such a fleeting, temporary thing. Like it wouldn't even make sense to put in a tent. Why does Moses have to stay in a tent? Yeah. Uh, well, also, where did Moses' body come from? Well, okay, we've had. I think we've had that debate before too. When we looked at the Book of Jude. Um, there is some debate about Moses' body, um, but the basic issue, basic uh, point here, I think, is that humans have a natural... So Peter was the one who denied that Jesus had to go to the cross, mm-hmm. right? And I'll never, I'll never let that happen to you, and Jesus has to say, behind me, Satan. Peter has... He thinks in very earthly, temporal terms. Yeah, and, and glory terms. So like... Uh, We've talked about prosperity theology in the past here, success theology or triumphalistic theology. And uh, Peter is in some ways a like forerunner of those kinds of false prophets. The idea that like, well, if you believe hard enough, everything in this lifetime will become successful and that sort of thing. If you just have enough faith, uh, everything in life will go well. Well, no one had more faith than Jesus and he has to come down the mountain. Mm-hmm. You know, like, so it, it's not, there's something metaphorical in the idea that they're experiencing a foretaste of the glory of God, but then they have to go, Jesus is the one that has to remind them, no, we got to go back down the mountain. Mm-hmm. And there's times in life where you get little slices of heaven in the same, mm-hmm. that, same way that in this wilderness of life, there's times when you get slices of hell, mm-hmm. but the slices of heaven, we want, we like, don't want the party to end. And uh, you have to understand that this side of heaven, you have to remain balanced between, you, you always have hope. The, the hell is, the slices of hell is gonna go away, it'll get better. But you also have to temper the euphoria of mm-hmm. when you have really good times and say like, no, but this isn't heaven, so I'm not gonna sink down my roots too deep. I'm not gonna set up, I'm not gonna build a house here. Mm-hmm. You know, that kind of thing. Every party I've gone to, I didn't want to end. You tend to be one that, yes, uh, likes to... Keep the fun going. Yes, keep the party going. And uh, it, like it, there has to be a balance between those two so that you don't get too high and too low. Mm-hmm. Okay. Emotional thought number two, uh, failure to drive out demons. So again, they're on a mount of glory. They descend into, again, sort of metaphorically, a valley of demons. Um, there is a crowd waiting there for them to come down. There is a man who has a boy who has been demon possessed and the demon demonic possession is manifesting itself in, uh, seemingly like epileptic seizures, as well as suicide attempts. The boy has thrown himself into a fire on numerous occasions and disciples who previously have been sent out by Jesus with the authority to work miracles and drive out demons can't do it. And they don't know why, mm-hmm. and the other people don't know why, and it's a little peculiar. And Jesus comments here, it's because you have little faith. Now, in the parallel gospel accounts of this, it says this kind of demon can only come out by prayer and fasting. Mm-hmm. But the acts of prayer and, and fasting are both spiritual acts of dependency on God, which means at some point in time, as the disciples are driving out demons and curing people, they probably bought their own hype, got full of themselves, and they thought that the ability to do so was just this innate ability that they had. It's very similar to like what happens with Samson when God has given him his power and it's, he has to abide by certain rules and he thinks, nope, it's just mine, so you can cut my hair off, I'll be fine. Mm-hmm. You know, um, But they, they buy their own hype and Jesus, like pride is the enemy of faithfulness mm-hmm. and faith. And so uh, Jesus is, is at this point sort of lamenting even the spiritual pride that he sees in his disciples. He drives the demon out of the boy. Uh, the boy is uh, cured, but becoming full of your, the real lesson in this is becoming full of yourself leads to a complete spiritual incompetence, which is why God has to always uh, allow the painful, humble, humbling things that he does in our lives. Mm-hmm. You know, like Paul says about his thorn in the flesh, God gave me this so as to not 
to keep me from becoming conceited. Yeah. Why does God allow some of the pain that he does so as to keep us from becoming conceited? You and I don't know because pride, again, sort of blinds us. Mm -hmm. We don't know how much success it would take for us to become totally full of ourselves. And so God has to allow some thorns in the flesh. He has to allow some failures to keep us humble, Mm -hmm. which is helpful for our faith. Um, Any specific thing that you feel like God allows you recurring humility lessons on in order to keep you dependent on him can can or will you answer this for me i will and i can (laughs) i feel like i'm in such a place right now of contentment where like i'm just really grateful for everything Mm -hmm. i don't have any like huge worries or struggles right now Mm -hmm. i'm almost i almost don't want to say it out loud do you remember when we were reading Back at Resurrection, when we were doing Walking with God Through Pain and Suffering, mm-hmm. and Becky said, I almost don't even want to read this because I feel like I'm inviting suffering into my life because I'm learning, ultimately, yeah. like it brings you closer to God or strengthens your faith. And I both want to get closer to God, but don't, my flesh doesn't want to go through yeah. suffering. Yeah, so like I don't, that's, I don't even want to say this, but like I feel like there's no... I mean, there definitely have been in the past and, Mm -hmm. you know, but there's what you just answer it for me. No, I I think it's, it's the right question is at some point in time, you have to become, just embrace the idea that whatever, what God ordains is always good Mm -hmm. kind of, kind of thing, right? Like, so if he allows suffering, it draws me closer. That's a good thing. If he doesn't allow me suffering, Mm -hmm. um, and I get to experience greater comfort or pleasure or whatever that's a good thing in both mm-hmm. cases i can and should because it, it's appropriate i should praise him mm-hmm. and i should worship him for it and i'll let him decide what i need and when mm-hmm. you know it's not up to simply me to decide what i need and when and, and mm-hmm. the idea that i could like pull some levers or say like i'll trick him i won't say it out loud and then <laughs> he will like no it doesn't quite work like that so uh i think the general posture of gratitude and also a posture of worship i'm grateful whether it's it's suffering that draws me closer or whether it's success that is undeserved but i certainly enjoy i'm gonna praise god either way Mm -hmm. you know i feel like i'm just in a period of it's partially finishing my um my doctorate and like that that's it right like there's no more really goals Mm. or anything yeah in the whatever distant future yeah. This is why I feel like a lot of women I work with, when they get to this point, then they start having children because it's like the next step. Right. But I feel like I have no next step and I'm okay with, I'm okay with that. Like it just feels good right now to just be. Yeah. And there might not be an obvious next step right now, but, um, there's always, it's like, okay, whatever God leads me to or puts in front of me. Um, I, you know, I think for me, it's been a various amount of recurring frustrations in my life, right down to struggling with an anxiety disorder or, or for that matter, having to, I think when people have to take at various points, various medications, Mm -hmm. and there's something humbling about having on like a daily basis to take something that's Mm -hmm. like, okay, my overall, I can't function well unless this tiny little thing and it makes you feel small and it makes you feel a little bit weak Mm -hmm. um and as long as it doesn't affect your overall like identity in christ there's actually something sort of healthy and humbling about that this is what it's like living with someone with an anxiety disorder every pen in your household will no longer have the little flipper i have snapped off it will be broken off at some point from various ticks the thing that is supposed to go like onto your like pocket protector that little handle thing i'm amazed that one still has one i well these ones i I bought them in part because they're in like industrial strength like for anxiety ridden people but like uh i've snapped them off of most pens and sometimes i'll do them like right during conversations with people (laughs) well i don't i haven't noticed as much but you used to i have a couple nervous ticks yeah twiddle the seam the inseam on your pant leg technically speaking yes uh yeah i haven't noticed that as much do you still do it i have calluses on my thumbs of like uh sort of nervous tick things i think you're getting better when i get anxious about that stuff yeah it, it's it's one of those things. It's annoying <laughs> and it's weird, um, but it's like it's partially my thing, you know. And it just is. It, it keeps me humble. Exactly. Uh, devotional thought number three: 
Uh, to not cause offense. So I mentioned this is this account is only ever. It, interestingly, it's recorded only in Matthew's Gospel, which is partially interesting because he was a tax collector and he records a miracle about miraculous provision for paying <laughs> paying taxes. Um, it's a unique miracle, miracle, not only because Matthew's the only one who records it. It's it's um, the only miracle Jesus performs where he's essentially like providing for his own needs as opposed to the needs of others. Um, it's the only miracle where he's just like, uh, arguably, where he's just producing money. Mm-hmm. Like there, there's always this thought, like if Jesus can do anything, why doesn't why isn't he just... Well, President Biden does miracles would, all the would, time. Uh, he yes, just prints it off. Jesus would be jacking up the inflation <laughs> in ancient Palestine. But um, like, why hasn't he just produced more money? It's, it's also one of the only, interestingly, miracles with like a single fish. And even that... Like you think about the, the sovereignty of God and the chain of events that have to happen. So at some point in time in the past, someone has dropped a coin into the lake. Mm-hmm. A, a fish, for whatever reason, has to choose to eat a coin. That doesn't have to happen. Food. It's a miracle. He could just it could just appear in the fish's mouth. Uh, I suppose. Um, I think generally speaking, defaulting to rather than like out of nothing manifestation Uh the idea of like sovereignty and controlling things to happen is usually more the way the miracles Mm -hmm. of jesus seem to work but you're right it could go a couple of different ways but point being it's so bizarre like the first fish that he catches he's going to open his mouth and find Mm -hmm. the exact amount of payment for the taxes of jesus the temple tax of jesus and peter uh it's 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 really interesting. It it's also, but that's not even necessarily why it's recorded. It's recorded uh, specifically because Jesus gives this whole like, well, who owes taxes? Um, the family members of does the king's family owe taxes or is it the others? And everybody, like in the ancient world, knows that the king's family is exempt from taxes. They're the ones that receive the taxes. And uh, so I'm the son of God, so it doesn't make sense. I, I would be exempt from this. But he says, so as not to cause offense. I'm going to lower myself. I'm going to humble myself. And I'm going to pay the tax too. Mm-hmm. And so he chooses, so as not to cause offense to the surrounding society. Jesus never hesitates um, to break man-made traditions of the Pharisees. But he was very careful to keep God's law. And even though technically he wouldn't have to do this to fulfill God's law, mm-hmm. he nonetheless chooses to do it uh, to forfeit his freedom for the sake of other people because he's a benevolent leader. We talked about this under Nehemiah. Mm-hmm. Leaders who don't take advantage of the privileges that are afforded to them because they care about their people so much. Uh, he's a benevolent leader who humbles himself and models life for his people. Uh, so... My question for you here is, is there anything in life that you feel like, yeah, I'm totally free to do this, but I choose not to because of other Christians. It might not be constructive for other Christians um, if I'm the one who's, if I'm doing this or something like that. I don't know if you got a chance to look at this ahead of time or not, <laughs> or if we're just going to put you on the spot and have to edit something. Out. No, I'm just thinking because my, my first answer is like, of course. Mm-hmm. Um... I more honestly though more so like maybe earlier in my life more so because I felt like well the pastor's wife can't do this yeah and even like sometimes you tell me like my shirts are too short Uh and I'm like this is stylish and you're like well not for you yeah midriff no one needs to see yeah, which I mean, and it's not like I'm wearing like whatever. It's just like if I raise the hallelujah, you might. Where's she being in your tube tops? Is <laughs> we had to put an end to that. Yeah, um, that's just like a silly example or whatever. But um, honestly, I think so. We were just talking about. So I drive like a, an old sedan, and uh, I said. Like, I can't wait to get a new car. I said, but I think it's good for me because I can afford to get a new car to not get a new car. I said, I'm not going to get one until we pay off my student loans, which will probably be like another year. So I'll have to drive this car through another winter. Um, I said, I actually think it's good for me and good for other people to see like, okay, like even though someone can afford something, they're choosing not to live extra to live under your means, I guess. Yeah. Maybe that was a roundabout way of saying that. Well, you know, like a society that is constantly in credit debt, 
um, mm-hmm. which just means you're living beyond your means, right? Like, so there's, there's certain things that you probably have to get loans for in the modern world, whether it's a house or education. Yeah. But uh, a, the, a lot of people, the majority of people are in many ways living beyond what they actually have and are borrowing that money from others, paying mm-hmm. interest on it and, and that sort of thing. And so the idea of, the, there's something countercultural about living under your means. The whole, like, just because you could, you didn't stop to think about whether or not you should. Mm-hmm. That's a quote from Jurassic Park. But just because you can doesn't yeah. mean that you should in the life of a Christian, right? Right. Yes, yes. Uh, yes, which is is denying your flesh, yes. right? Like one of the calls of Christ is to deny the flesh. The flesh wants as much. It's like this insatiable appetite. It wants as much as it can, as much power, as much comfort. Mm-hmm. And to say no to that is to live often under your means. So, mm-hmm. yeah. Uh, and as Christian, you know, I, I also I've mentioned this before too, but I used to be sort of afraid of the glass house concept as. Um, a pastor or mm-hmm. pastor's family kind of thing and then at some point in time it hit me like it's not just a, i mean maybe it is a pastor but it's not just a pastor it's every christian like i should be willing to live in a bit of a glass house if i'm just being a christian mm-hmm. because we what we do is we testify and witness to the rest of the world about how good god has been to us telling about god's goodness to us means talking about our, our weaknesses our frailties our sins our and it's inviting people in to look in your your glass house. So that's a Christian thing. It's not just like a minister thing. Mm-hmm. And I think at that point, I just sort of embraced the idea of it. So. Mm-hmm. All right. Anything else on Matthew 17? What about you? Anything you want to do but you don't do? Um, you know, uh, there's certain things I have just sort of stayed out of that I have, I certainly have opinions on that I just stay out of. Uh Um, And it could be like the obvious and the low hanging one is, is uh, politics. Like, I think it's fascinating. I think it's interesting. I think it's, but I also think it's uh, unnecessarily competitive and proud and arrogant and mudslinging Mm -hmm. and all that kind of stuff. And so I might have an, a political opinion about something, but if it isn't like an underlying scriptural mm-hmm. teaching, I don't weigh in on it. Mm-hmm. I don't do much at all in the way of like Twitter, even though I kind of want to a lot of times, just because I think the actual medium of it is so unhealthy for our society. Uh-huh. So like giving, throwing out, I think that would be something. Just throwing out my opinions wherever on whatever. Uh-huh. Yeah. There's, there's a part of me that really wants to do it. Mm-hmm. And actually, it's, it's been interesting talking to like, you know, college students that I work with and just being able to say like, you don't have to express every opinion that you have. Mm-hmm. If it doesn't build up others, you don't need to yeah. share it. Right here in my um, 2022 resolutions, it says withhold comments that are not good or beneficial. Yeah. We're almost at the end of 2022. I was gone. Well, I was looking at this earlier and it says accept and be content with my age. And people were asking me like, how was your birthday? And I'm like, honestly, it was one of the best birthdays I've ever had because it's one of the first times that I wasn't like lamenting how old I'm getting. Mm -hmm. You know, I was just like really happy to spend time with you, to spend time with friends and... Yeah, you know, and it was a Tuesday birthday too, which can be kind of anticlimactic. To be like, I had the PTO to be able to take my birthday off and, yeah. you know. Yeah. Nope, I do know. All right, let's close the prayer. So my, they're going great. Thanks for asking. <laughs> uh, Heavenly Father, we have much to be grateful for. Um, the moments that do go well, we sort of want, we don't want to jinx them. We want to set up the tents and live in them and experience them and... Uh, you know, we're not going to apologize for them because you've blessed us with them, those good moments. So we're just going to be grateful and thank you for them. And yet we're also not going to be afraid of when the tides shift in life and things get harder. And we're going to worship you in those moments too, because we understand our time here is temporary and you are taking us to a promised land and you are willing to go down a mountain of glory, uh, in order to serve others. And we're willing to put ourselves out there too, for that. Um, We ask you to bless that. We ask you to give us encouragement to do that, especially as we see how you've done it for us. In your name we pray. Amen. Thanks for studying with us today. We'll see you next time from Matthew chapter 18.